Good evening, welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director and bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're pleased to welcome Nicholas Butler to our At Home with Literati series in support of Godspeed and in conversation this evening with author Steph Cha. Uh, just a quick webinar overview for our attendees as you're joining us. The chat is closed, but you can keep the chat window open. So I'll be dropping links to purchase Godspeed from Literati throughout the event. You can use the Q&A feature on your toolbar to submit questions at any time. And I will ask a selection at the conclusion of the conversation. And live transcription is available to you on your toolbar as well. And if you're watching us later on YouTube, of course, there will be always be links to purchase books uh, from both of our authors this evening directly below me in the description. You can also subscribe to catch more of our events after they're live. As a reminder, you can shop for more books at Literati Bookstore dot com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. Most of all, we'd like to thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us from. Now I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Nicholas Butler is the internationally best-selling author of the novels Shotgun Love Songs, The Hearts of Men, and Little Faith in the story collection Beneath the Bonfire. Butler is the recipient of multiple literary prizes and commendations and has published articles, reviews, short stories, and poetry in publications such as Plowshares, Narrative, and the New York Times Book Review, among others. A graduate of the Univers University of Wisconsin-Madison and the Iowa Writers Workshop, he now lives with his wife and two children on 16 acres of land in rural Wisconsin. And Steph Cha is the author of Your House Will Pay, winner of the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and the California Book, of, Book Award and the Juniper Song Crime Trilogy. She's a critic whose work has appeared in the Los Angeles Times, USA Today, and the Los Angeles Review of Books, where she served as noir editor. Please join me in welcoming Nicholas Butler and Steph Cha into your living rooms. Hi. Hey. Hey. Nick. hey. Uh, so I thought uh, maybe we could start with a reading from your wonderful book, which sure. I enjoyed immensely. Um, yeah. Um, also, before we get going, I just want to say it's really nice to see you. I, I think I saw you and your husband. In 2014. 2014. <laughs> and we had a really wonderful time eating great food and drinking great yeah. drinks. And that just feels like a completely different world than where we are now. I know. Uh, I mean, it was at a book festival. Remember book festivals? Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, we were like festival buddies. <laughs> that, yeah, that yeah. was that, that was a lot of fun because I didn't know a lot of people. And that was that ended up I ended up having like really great time. I, I was just I um, I've always I, I always just feel really awkward at those events and I don't feel super connected. And you and your husband were just really kind to me and warm to me. And I I haven't forgotten that. And also we had a blast. I thought I I had a blast. So oh, we had I, such a good time. We we yeah. drank a lot of good drinks and uh, I remember we like went to that place in the rain with like oysters. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's yeah. all I remember is a lot of oysters. Yeah. Yeah. So um, and, and I just want to say, like, I've been following your career and I love the newest book and uh, congratulations on your, your new kid and I'm happy. Everything seems like it's just going great for you. So. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's interesting. Cause I feel like uh, when we met, I think we were both at, we were both at like St. Martin's and I think our agents were at the same agency and like my agent has since left that agency. I think yours did too. He's still there, but oh I, no, he's but, still there. Yeah, okay, yeah. But I, I, we, my agent left that agency, and also we both ended up at Echo. And like the way we yeah. got connected for this was through Faber, right? <laughs> like right. our UK, our UK I, editor is the same. So yeah, yeah, I feel like there's been this strange tracking, and I actually have some yeah. questions related to that later. Cool. All right. Well, I'll I'll read a little bit, and then I can't I can't wait to just shoot the shit. So um, so this is just the very beginning of the book. Um. This was the house that would change their fortunes. They could feel it. Cole had barely steered his pickup off the highway and passed through an open cattle gate before they began climbing the dusty canyon road north. And they could feel it. Money. Like a vibration in the crisp mountain air, it was humming out there in expectancy, a promise, and they were driving toward it, cotton mouth, skin crawling. 
they could practically see it on the wind pushing the late summer leaves swaying the yellowing meadow grasses smiling down upon the dappled river water below the whole world here looked like money money just waiting to be plucked up off the ground the leaves like greenbacks the shimmer of the water like silver coins they needed this house this break they needed this work work for what sounded like as much as a year maybe more not the thankless backbreaking tedium they'd been reduced to for the past few years either no this was something to build a reputation on uh, a name, something to stake a man for decades, the kind of signature house a person could point to and proudly say, I built that, me, I built that. The kind of house that 30 years from now when they were all broken down old men, they could travel to with their grandchildren and be welcomed like masters of some dying art. Bart rode in the passenger seat, blinking down at the chasm that had now fallen away just an arm's length from the gravel road, not even a mile off the highway, and already the country was wild, wild, wild. Below the road snaked a river raging white and blue, cataracts tumbling, and above them, off the low mountainsides, wispy waterfalls spilled down like great lengths of silver white hair. A prominent dip of chew bumped out Bart's lower lip, and by and by he spit into an empty Coca-Cola can. I lived here almost 20 years, and I ain't ever been down this road, he said, peering over at Cole, who took the gravel track with white-knuckled respect. A blown-out tire wouldn't just be a pain in the ass out here. It would put them behind schedule for their noon meeting with the homeowner. You ever been back here, Cole? Cole shook his head no, fixing Bart with a meaningful look for as long as he dared before turning back to the road ahead of them. This is big, pristine, private country, the look communicated. You and me, we don't just get invited back here. She told me she had a driveway punched in this summer, Cole said, another two miles or so off this road. He pointed an index finger up into the mountain, somewhere up in there, I'm guessing. You imagine the kind of bread they're spending? Teddy put in from the back seat of the extended cab. I mean, a two-mile driveway up here? That's an Army Corps-type operation. All that goddamn California money is what it is, Bart said. Hell, that state's filling up. Cheaper for them to come out here and plop a house down on a mountaintop than it is to buy a nice two-bedroom in San Diego or Los Angeles. Cheaper to build a house in the clouds. Lunacy, you ask me. And uh, maybe maybe I'll stop there. I, I never want to go on too long. Um. You know, maybe we'll start with uh, with the house and the setting. You know, I think uh, yeah. the 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 uh, the you you live in Wisconsin near Eau Claire, where you grew up, and you have written a lot about Wisconsin. And this book yeah. is set in Wyoming, in this yeah. kind of very very stark, memorable background uh, backdrop. You know, and I feel like it's kind of a definitive feature of the book. Um, can you talk about how you landed on this place? Yeah. Um, after we built our house in 2014, a family friend of mine uh, came over and he was telling me about a building project that he was working on not far from us. And uh, they fell, him and the other guys on the building crew fell behind schedule. And the homeowner got everybody together and said that she'd offer them each a five figure bonus if they finished the house in the next three weeks. And he turned to me and he said, Nick, if we had all the meth in the world, we couldn't have finished that house in three weeks. And I thought, that seems like a pretty, pretty good idea for a book. Um, yeah. um, but that was back in 2014. And I just couldn't, I couldn't see how I would really write that book about Wisconsin. Um, I think part of it is that although winters are bad here, they're not as bad as being up in the mountains in Wyoming. And I think I started, you know, asking questions about what kind of homeowner that is, how much money did they have, what the house was like. And I just thought like, it would be interesting to put it in one of the most exclusive real estate markets in North America. And, and, you know, we, we traveled a bit through that area as a family. And I was like, this is, this is the place. The mountains are bigger here. Winter's tougher. The money is, is way bigger. Um, and so, yeah, Jackson just kind of seemed like a, a more natural place to put it. Uh, yeah, it's like it's like very rich people second home territory, right? I think yes, exactly. Have you spent much time in Jackson proper, or just? Kind of no, I really area? haven't. And I think what what we did is we 
we spent a lot of time in Yellowstone and then we came down through Jackson and I felt pretty, I was very naive. I, uh, I thought, whoa, this is, what's this beautiful quaint ski town. I wonder if we could, you know, what does real estate cost here? Yeah. And, uh, got on the real estate listings and was like, who the, f- who the hell can it's like $15 here? million. Dollars. <laughs> yeah. Like the cheap, the cheapest house I think you could find was a complete dump for three quarters of a million dollars. Um, I think if I'd set the book in Jackson proper, there would have been many opportunities for me to make mistakes because I didn't know the landscape inside and out. But we passed through Jackson and we did some camping in Bridger Teton National Forest where we were hanging out at this hot springs and we did spend quite a bit of time there. And I, mm-hmm. and then I had a chance to sort of absorb that landscape well. And so, um, that was what was really important to me is like understanding the site where the house was. Oh, and I guess, you know, now that you, now that you mention it, I mean, it is like, it is a confined space, even though it feels so expansive and like its own world, but in, but you kind of got to make up all the rules for it. Yeah. Which is, which is kind of a neat trick. I feel like I should try that sometime. (laughs) It was not. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, um, I don't know how it works for you, but like after the book was was bought and and it was clear that it was going to be published, then I, I I had some, you know, sort of second thoughts, like, did I know this area well enough to really write about it? But um, but I've been really like heartened, you know, getting a blurb from CJ Box, who's a guy from Wyoming, like a lifelong Wyoming resident, that made me feel spectacular yeah uh, i talked to my friend john larson a couple nights ago and he's a lifelong westerner and he was like when i got your manuscript i had the red pen ready you know i was ready to to tell you what you'd gotten wrong and um yeah it just kind of worked nicely to to confine everything to the building site and also i didn't i never looked at it as like oh this is just a jackson story this thing this phenomenon is happening around america so yeah you know what i mean um it had, you know what, you know what it is, the like specific details of the setting were ones that you could really contain, but it yeah. has this kind of spirit of the West, like the kind of the untamed, but also extremely, extremely expensive and like up for grabs if you have the money West, you know, um, mm. and so I feel like, the, I feel like you had a lot of control over the particulars and then really got the spirit right, you know, there, yeah. this feels like a big you know, you, you know, when, uh, when Angus, our mutual editor, um, talked to me about this book, he said it had like the feel of like an old school, like morality tale. And I was like, yeah, this is kind of what it feels like. It feels like, like this grand, uh, this like kind of this, this like grand epic uh, that has like a very like stark shape to it. You know, these kind of characters who go on this, this like horrible journey. Um, but I mean, you know, the, but the setting is something that really stood out to me. You know, another thing is that I want to talk to you about is, um, you know, when we met, I was writing PI novels and you were writing like these very, like, <laughs> these very, like, feely, emotionally complex, like, novels about, like, you know, people in their 30s, like, navigating marriages, like, very, very literary. And I feel like this is also very literary, like, kind of, it had it reads like a Nicholas Butler novel, but it is also a suspense novel. You know, it has crime elements and like and the whole feel of it is just I think just that engine of the like of the like massive bonus they get this done. You know, it's got that clock on it from the very beginning and the yeah. stakes are so high. Yeah. Um so it's 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 a suspense novel, you know. I think I think it's even it's even uh billed like as as a thriller. Uh, which I think is a first for you, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's I, fair. And I want to, I, and I wanted to talk to you about that because, uh, because I think, uh, you know, I know why I ended up writing crime novels, you know, um, and I wanted to ask you like h- how you ended up writing this story that is it is kind of a suspense novel, you know, was there any kind of did that did uh, did that. Uh, did that bump up against your kind of like literary pedigree <laughs> and like what 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 was what was it about this this particular like engine that appealed to you 
Yeah. Um, well, that's a great question. I mean, I, I've been super fortunate um, to be able to, to write the stories that I want to each and every time. And sometimes that that's meant that um, the decisions I've made haven't, haven't always been like the most commercial decisions. I mean, I, I think to get back to something that you brought up, like about being with St. Martin's in the beginning, uh, I, I think what they wanted was shotgun love songs, one, two, three, four, or five, you know? Um, but I, I didn't, I couldn't, I couldn't write that at the time. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be able to, to publish other stories. When it came to this book, I just took a, a walk with my wife and I described two different books, two different plots. And she said, well, you seem like obviously more excited about this Godspeed book. So why don't you go after that? And, and I've been really, you know, fortunate to not have to consider um, genre or, you know, to me, I, I thought I was writing like a literary thriller. Like, I don't, I don't know mm -hmm. if you've read Scott Smith's A Simple Plan, but I was shooting for something kind of like that. And I didn't, I didn't see it as being so far away from everything else that I'd written because it was still about male friendship. I was still paying attention to um, writing on a molecular level. You know, I, I wanted to write something that was quality and, um, and then, you know, I, I guess, I guess uh, I didn't, th I didn't think about it a whole lot, you know, um, I don't know. Yeah. Why, why, why did you make the switch from writing your PI books to writing your house will pay, which is such a great book. Yeah. I think uh, I, when I, I will say when I wrote my first PI book, you know, I wasn't thinking that I would be a crime writer for my whole career. It's just that I wanted to write that kind of PI novel that dealt with Raina right. Chandler. And then once I started writing crime fiction, I realized the kind of potential it has to, it, I feel like um, there's something about crime that helps you unlock uh, unlock character and unlock place. And actually, that's how I ended up asking about crime too, because like setting and that sense of place is just such an important feature in crime fiction. You know, it's something that readers of crime right. fiction and suspense fiction like look for is that strong right. sense of place. Because I think when you are working with some of the materials that you have always been working with, you know, like an in intimate settings, you know, kind of the like the the kind of relationship dynamics between people. You know, and especially when, you know, you write so much about masculinity and the relationships between men, you know, especially when you kind of dig down into that, like, there is like crime territory, like, you know, it's pretty adjacent, you know, and I think that in a lot of these, when you look at a lot of these character dynamics, when you look at all a lot of these social settings, you know, if you throw a crime in there, and it raises such interesting questions. You know, and that's yeah. now what really appeals to me about crime fiction, you know, just that that capability of it to kind of take a knife to 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 any situation and kind of like show you exactly what's going on and really like force you to look at it. And that's yeah. that's really what I got. Uh, you know, I, I really got that satisfying sense out of this book. Obviously, it's it's incredibly written. I think like the intricacy of it is like, I mean, it's definitely a literary thriller. That's definitely what it is. Uh, but like, you know, you add the meth. And like the meth, like really kind of makes everything sizzle in this mm. way that is both threatening and illuminating, right? I mean, you, you have an opening quote about like being crystallized. And I think that's something that comes up through the book. I think crime and, you know, in the same way that like that, dr that like the drugs in this book kind of sharpen the awareness that these people have and kind of raise the stakes. Like, I think crime and suspense have that same effect, that like crystallizing effect. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's funny. I mean, like in your book, one thing that I appreciated and it was something I was going after in Godspeed is I like when, um, when you put characters in a place where they have to make a moral decision mm -hmm. and they make the wrong decision. And then you give that character time over pages and pages to correct their decision and they still don't, Yeah, you know, um, and um, so I don't know, I, you know, I was looking, I was looking at books like, you know, A Simple Plan. I was looking at books like Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Um, yeah. And just thinking about like, sort of, you know, 
like, well, what if these guys would, would go after this deadline and what if they had to resort to meth and, and, um, you know, allowing them the time to sort of back out of that agreement, to back out of the deal, to stop using meth, to not commit crimes. Um, and, and I, my hope is that the emotions that those characters are going through are, are pretty universal that everybody who's reading it is asking themselves, well, what would I do if somebody was holding $350,000 in front of me? And I'd already put in all, you know, it's not just like somebody's holding a check out there and you haven't put any effort. What if they're holding a check out in front of you and you put in everything you've got, you know, what would you do? I I found that to be, you know, it's, it's funny that you mentioned the, the Sierra Madre, uh, now that I think about it, it it does have that feel of the like the friends who fi- who stumble on a on a hidden treasure. Like that actually is what it feels like, and the way that the friends, you know, kind of each react. And it's also interesting because they don't all, you know, they all kind of come at the project in different ways, right? So like right. Bart really becomes the this like machine, this like meth machine, and he's just going, 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 and they need him to be like that. And they and the other two because of his use, the other two get to maintain. Um, you know, Teddy gets to spend time like a little more time with his family than the than than the other two who like don't have families. You know, he gets a little more personal time. He also kind of gets to keep his hands clean in a way that the other two don't. And you know, and and, and Cole, you know, he is off. He's kind of turning a blind eye. Teddy like almost doesn't know. Cole, you know, but it's it's like a very interesting intricate dynamic right where they all kind of bring a different thing to the table and yeah. they all kind of end up in the muck of it uh, right. you know I, I i was curious you know I, and, and i want you to talk a little bit more about about these characters and kind of where they came from but you know as a starting point did you have a favorite among the three um oh, i don't know i mean i like the idea of retiring to panama and uh <laughs> And having some money in the bank, um, I don't know. I mean, the dynamic you're describing was fun for me. It's and I didn't think of it as being so different from my other books because I think about it as being, you know, that level of adult friendship where you're where you're friends with somebody, but as an adult, you don't know what's going on inside your adult friendship, the intricacies of your adult friends' minds and lives. And I love the idea that you know, like Cole and Teddy, they need this for their families and their future. And they're looking at it in sort of a, as in a way to advance, but they don't know that their friend's knees are just shot. You know, yeah. Bart, Bart just wants to get out because he's in constant pain. Um, so that was, that was, you know, that was, that was fun. Um, but I don't know that I really had a favorite. I mean, in some ways I don't like, I don't know how you work, but I don't really like to go back into the book and read it after I'm done. (laughs) There's nothing I can really do anymore, but I did have to go back and read it for something. And I, and Gretchen was a fun character to write, you know, because I think because I'm a guy and because I tend to write about guy friendships, that's what people focus on, but she's the, she's the emotional key to what, what's going on. She's the reason why the house is being built where it is. She's the reason why there's a deadline. You can even, if you read it, I mean, it's her family's medical history that leads her to where she is, you know? Uh, yeah, and, I was actually, you know, actually well, going to ask, oh, was actually gonna ask you about that character because, you know, she's both like this total monster, like all of this happens because of her, you know? And it's, inter- and it's also interesting because, you know, she's not holding a gun to their heads. She's holding a bag of money. Like it's, a, it's kind right. of a different... It's an interesting sort of coercion that I haven't seen before, but it is about, it, it is like, it is not like when you come to the power dynamic of it, it's not that dissimilar from her holding a gun to their heads, you know? Like they right. kind of, they like need it. And she's like kind of dangling this with like no regard for what it'll co- what it might cost them. Um, right. But she's, but I thought you wrote her in a way that was like very, you didn't, vil- you don't villainize her like ever and you know there are a lot of reasons why she's sympathetic that we don't have to go into in great detail or for fear of spoiling but you know I think I thought she was a pretty fascinating character somebody I hadn't really seen before that she's this like very very hard hard driven 
lo like lawyer who has given her whole life to to her work and uh you know and now she wants to work on this house that's gonna be like you know the crown jewel of like any any like heritage um you know but she, it's not clear who she's supposed to share that with um and so yeah it's i i i, I wanted to ask uh you know how you kind of uh walk that line of you know maintaining sympathy for this character who you know is she, she, you know she is there, there is something like monstrous about her yeah well what's interesting you know you were talking about um overlaps or connections that you and i have had in our career and in our lives and we both uh without getting too much into it we both have connections to the law in our family if i remember correctly mm -hmm. um my wife was a you know a very successful corporate attorney for a while and graduated at the top of her class from UW-Madison. And, um, and we had a taste of, of what her working for a firm like that would look like. And, and we also had a real taste for the difficulties of being a, a, a woman and trying to keep up with male partners in that, in that industry. It's really hard if you want to have a family. Um, and one thing that, that we spent a lot of time about, and I'm sure my wife spent more time thinking about than me, was the fact that she was like, her whole life was just billing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't make her a monster. It doesn't make her a worse person. That's her industry. Um, but then you start thinking about constructing a character who has a tight deadline and all the money in the world to pay for something. And you think about time and mortality and death. And I think a lot of uh, watching my wife's work and her life led to writing that character, you know, and, and thinking about the kind of, you know, frankly, female character who would have entered the law at a time where she would have really needed to be super tough and committed mm -hmm. to, her, to her practice to uh to gain the respect of her peers and to hang around yeah so yeah, i didn't i had i had sympathy for her you know yeah i have a lot of sympathy for her you know and, and in some ways she's also doing this thing where she's kind of squinting and pretending that like what she's doing doesn't have you know i think like so when they when she brings in this crew like she has already lost somebody. There has already been a worker who's been killed because of the like difficult circumstances. And she's just kind of like trying to power through it, you know, yeah. like trying to pretend like the money is enough, you know? And, and I think like something that's interesting about the mechanics of this book is that like the suspense comes from this setup that is all about this time crunch, you know, and it's about kind of, and it deals with kind of this idea of, you know, the value, the money value of time uh, and, and I think like when when you're looking at that as one of the core concepts of a novel, it can't help but be suspenseful. But I want to ask if how um, were you thinking about managing suspense like during this book? Because I thought I because there's a big turning point. You know, I won't I won't spoil it. It's I, there. You wrote one of the like one of the like most memorable sequences. I, um, that I've like oh, that that I've like read in anything like of late like that just this incredibly like memorable like couple pages where it's just like whoa uh, I think I like emailed Angus like right after I read that you know oh thanks and, <laughs> he loves you like, <laughs> he talks about you all the time in emails so yeah but you know up until that th there that's this turning point in the novel and you know exactly which one I'm talking about and so I'm wondering how you kind of managed suspense like up to that point if you were thinking about it in those terms um and i guess also relatedly you know did you outline this book uh well i'll answer uh, i didn't outline the book um i think the book was written uh, in just kind of a wave of energy um and it was important for me to sustain that kind of uh energy um, to put myself on the same sort of deadline as the guys were on. I'd, I'm not sure what your practice is, is like, and, and, and I know your life is busy and busier now, but like, I don't really write super quick compared to some writers that I know. So for me, I was writing fast. 
Um, in terms of managing suspense, I don't know, Steph. Like, I don't – I'm going to be 42 this fall, and I don't feel like I, I know – enough about my craft yet to know, <laughs> you know, like really how to, how to manage things. I, I, I think some reviews have, have said that the book is maybe a little uh, slow in the beginning. I didn't, I didn't oh, view I didn't it that, that way, but um, it felt super tense like the whole time. Yeah. Well, one thing I've been struggling with and, you know, like, I don't know how you feel about this, but I'd rather have a book end well then start well. Mm -hmm. But I feel like we're in a kind of a weird spot in our culture where like, if you launch a TV series, everything's got to happen in the first 10 minutes of the first episode. Otherwise nobody's going to continue watching the series. And I think that's sort of begun to permeate different sorts of uh, medians. You know, like if, if everything doesn't happen in the first chapter of your novel, well, then it's slow. Well, I don't know. I mean, that's not, I don't, You know, when I think about, like, I know you're a huge fan of noir, and when I think about some of the noir that I've read, there's some table setting that has to take place. You know, Mm -hmm. there's like a smoky office or a bar or something, and and you know that's going to be important later, but you got to set the table first. So I don't, I don't know that I, I don't know that I feel equipped to to answer a question about like managing suspense. Um, And I was thinking about a book. You know, I was I was thinking a lot about a book like Deliverance, which to me ends and and like it could be the beginning of another novel. Like those guys on the river had killed people. The sheriff knows something's wrong. The lake is filling up and they just go back to their lives. Well, that's like <laughs> that's inconclusive, you know, I mean, um but that's kind of more of the book that I, the more of the kind of style that I was shooting for. Yeah, I think it's a challenge, you know, I think uh, I, I, I asked because, you know, my, my last book also like had kind of a turning point, like a third of the way through. And, mm-hmm. and I had the hardest time writing those first like 80 pages, you know, and that's like what I had to keep going back and like kind of trying to layer with tension. But I found like, I, I yeah. found this book to be so but- tense from pretty much the very beginning I guess because you at least you like kind of hang the premise up right up front and so it feels it it feels high stakes from the beginning you know you and 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 there's this sense of dread like they're go barreling towards something yeah and in your book I think you did it really well because you set the table early on great opening scene young characters I think like the reader feels um attached to like these like sort of innocent young characters. And then the, you know, I don't know how this, again, I'm, I still feel like hopefully I'm at the beginning of my career, but like in your book, you started building the characters and we get closer to the characters. And I, I thought that's kind of what storytelling was about, you know? Yeah, like, I, 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 I agree. I get impatient with this stuff too, but it, it, it is, there is, a, there is, cer- there are certainly a lot of readers, I think, especially, especially, you know, I think, probably for the first time with this book you're probably going to have people who are picking it up because they think they're going to get like a, a crime novel you know and yeah. I've always had that expectation I think readers have all, I've always expected that of my readers but I think there yeah. is like a slight difference in like the expectation there and I think uh, <laughs> you know sometimes that like hunger for like something to happen immediately I'm like no just wait a little bit it'll be good it'll be worth yeah. it yeah <laughs> yeah yeah I don't know how to um all I can say is that in my own personal taste, I'd, I'd way rather know that I, I nailed the ending, you know, that I nailed the landing than, than the first five pages. But, and that but I also, up is like very, you know, that, duh, 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 you know, that's, that's, right. I, 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 as a reader, I always find that part really satisfying too, you know, especially yeah. with this, with, with the way that, your book was going it just felt so tense and it was really kind of you know think the screws were really tightening and it's like really uncomfortable like oh god like you know it's like it's a very anxious reading experience like Mm -hmm. I'd say I'd say you know almost the whole way through I think the meth has a lot to do with it um but yeah I just it it felt it's like it was like kind of stressful to read you know in a a very (laughs) good way um 
you know, I, I also wanted to ask about the meth writing, actually. Sure. That was so fun. Uh, just stylistically, you know, it pops off the page. There isn't that much of it, you know, it kind of right. like flavor, but it adds, it adds like, I don't know, it's like the, it's like a pinch of some very potent spice that you put in there. Can you talk about the meth writing? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, obviously I did, I did research into meth addiction and I felt like it was something, you know, important to write about because it's, it's a real epidemic in America. And, and, and by the way, the guy who, who told me the original anecdote, he was the one who brought it up. It's not like mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I began to ask myself questions about it because he had brought it up, not because uh, I thought it was like a vehicle for something necessarily. Um, and I talked to people who would use meth and um, got a picture of like what the, what the high felt like. And then when I got to those, yeah. I just wanted to show people what it looks like on the page because it really pops and it's really fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and then when I got to the, the points where I had to write that, I just tried to, you know, really jack up my, uh, heart rate and hold that, um, sort of sensation that had been described to me in my mind. And, um, and I wanted people to feel like they were like on a roller coaster that had just gone over the edge, you know, um, one gentleman described it to me as, uh, you're sitting on your couch but you're traveling 10,000 miles an hour. That's a scary, exhilarating feeling. Um, yeah. And, and it was, as, as a writer, it, it's sort of hard to capture too, you know, like how do you, how do you create speed on the page? Mm -hmm. No, I thought, I thought it worked really well, you know, and I think like, you, you know, it's, it's such a it's such an interesting stylistic almost like poetic trick that I wanted to ask you about it you know because it, it it does like kind of fizzle on the page um which is which is just a lot of fun um you know and you wrote this the whole book is in kind of close third with like yeah. alternating POVs and you know who whose voice came to you first uh, oh great Great question. That's a difficult question to answer too, because I feel like in my prior books, it was so character driven and I knew what characters I was really prizing. Like in my last book, Little Faith, I knew that it was going to be close to Lyle Hubdy's uh, point of view and uh, totally bought into that. With this book, I felt like, like I had been given this plot idea that dovetailed nicely with a lot of um, issues that America's going through right now. Mm -hmm. But I didn't feel like the characters, although I didn't want to write a flat character, of course, and I didn't want to write like an uncomplicated character. I, I felt like the plot was almost more important. Um, but I, I, I think, I guess I, I had, it had to be Gretchen because her backstory mm -hmm. was essential to what was happening. Yeah. You know, without that backstory, the whole book doesn't really work or the, or the heart, the heart behind the book doesn't work. Like then you're just doing a trick. It's uh, the trick is there's a clicking, uh, a ticking clock and we're going to throw in some math and we're going to throw in some crime and that's the book. But I'd like to believe that the book has, has some heart that this, this poor lady had a really um, sacred vision for what this house and this landscape were going to look like. And um, yeah, I mean, I think the book has a lot of heart, and a lot of the heart comes from the characters. It's interesting hearing you talk about uh, going plot first too, because you know I think like it's something that I hear a lot in in kind of on, on like panels and stuff about you know, do do plot or character first, and you know almost everybody answers character first, um, you know, and and I think that that tends to be where most people start most of the time, but like I also with my last book, I kind of started with a plot point, you know, I started with that shooting in mind. Um, yeah. And, and I also think like plot and character, you know, people treat them as if they're these separate entities when like plot is not like a convincing plot is not possible without character, you know, and plot <clears throat> right. should tell you something about character. So, you know, 
you right. started with a situation that had plot elements in it, but it wouldn't have worked right. without Gretchen, of course. And it, I think it also, you know, if it if if you hadn't given Cole, Bart, and Teddy their kind of individualities and their relationship with each other, it also wouldn't have gone anywhere, right? right. So I feel yeah. like you end up with the same. I feel like you end up with a lot of the same qualities as your other books. You just come at came at it from a different angle, which I find pretty yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Actually. Well, I don't know what it's like for you, but I also just, I don't know. I mean, I want to, I want to challenge, like, again, I just, I feel like I'm going to be 42. Like I'm at the, I hope I'm at the beginning of my career. I want to challenge myself and I want to be able to try to do different things. And, um, and let's face it. I mean, if you, if you say, oh, this was a plot came first, it's not, uh, it, it, it could sound to some people like you're not writing a serious book, I think. You know, if you if you say character first, no one's ever going to question. Yeah, that's why everyone says character integrity first. Integrity as a writer, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? But if you say, well, I had a banger of an idea. <laughs> I, I knew that the story was going to go great. Um, then it sounds like, you know, you're trying to write a Tom Clancy novel or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. But really, you know, you do, you do it all, you, you, you know, whatever, whatever order you do it in, as long as you put in the work and you do the revision, you know, it's mm -hmm. going to end up like, you know, it's like, yeah. uh, I think uh, it's like putting together, I don't know, it's like putting together a jigsaw puzzle, you know, most yeah. people start with the border, but you don't have to. <laughs> you don't have to. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. And Sally Kim, you know, really helped me out too. I mean, she, she felt like there needed to be like a deepening of, uh, I needed to deeper the reasons for why the house was being built where it was. Mm -hmm. And I hope I fulfilled her expectations, but I, I know I found her advice to be really helpful. And I thought harder and harder about why Gretchen would feel so passionate about building the house there and, and kind of went back to her origin stories and tried to fill that in as much as I could. So, yeah. I found it. I found it pretty convincing. Um, you know, uh, are you uh, are you working on another novel? Are you? And yeah. if so, and if so, does that have crime elements? Because I know Sally and Putnam. You know, I think that they do a lot of they do a lot of quality crime fiction. And so I'm wondering if you're just on the dark in the dark side now. I don't. I mean, I. <laughs> I don't know. I've got a couple ideas for books. How's that? And uh, and I've I've got my my toes in a couple different projects, and um, and I'm kind of at a point where I have to choose choose one to sort of focus on. Um, I loved writing this book, and I could totally see writing more books like this. Um, so we'll just have to we'll have to see. Yeah. Um. What, uh, I, I also wanted to ask, like, um, I guess you touched on like influences, but what are you, what are you reading now? Like, what are you, what are you reading for fun? And uh, have you been able to read during pandemic and all that? I should have brought my, uh, I keep a journal of books that I've read because uh, I, my memory is bad. I use Goodreads for that. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> I, should, I should be better on Goodreads. And I feel bad that I'm, I'm not. Um, my mom told me that she kept a journal. So then I thought, oh, well, that's a good idea. I'll do that. And um, what have I read that's been great? Well, I mean, one book that's coming out pretty soon uh, by a classmate of mine from Iowa named uh, Ash Davidson. I think it's called Damnation Spring. Um, it's set in the California Redwoods, I think in the 1970s. It's just a beautifully written book. And I'm not, I'm not, um, championing the book because she and I were such close friends at Iowa even even I mean we knew each other a little bit and when somebody sent me the book I was happy to read it because we were we were classmates and I want to help out people that I went to school with I'm blown away uh, um, as far as like older books I've read recently I read uh, Still Life with Woodpecker um, I really enjoyed that have you, have you read that one, Tom no, Robbins? I haven't. Oh no, I've I've only I only read his um, even cowgirls get the blues. Yeah, did you like that one? Not so I liked much. It okay. okay, I I liked parts of it. I liked the writing. Um, I thought I was gonna love it, and I just it just didn't. 
stick with me. They're weird books, I think. They're very they? weird. Yeah, yeah, they're very weird. Yeah, yeah. What else have I read? I don't know. What What have you re- read really recently? Um, I feel like I've read a lot of stuff like for work, uh, including like I'm reading like a million crime short stories for Best American. Um, I'm editing that anthology. Um, cool. What did I read recently? Oh, um, uh, I read recently Song of Solomon. That's a classic that I read recently for the first time. It's incredible. Talk about a weird Sorry, book. Martin. That's a weird one. Yeah. Um, so uh, a couple, yeah, so somebody asked what books or authors uh, you find inspiring. Um, did you have any that you wanted to add to that list? I know you talked about uh, Simple Plan and a couple of the books earlier, but. Yeah, um, that I find inspiring. Um, well, you know, the book is dedicated to B. Traven, who wrote Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Uh I don't know what it's like for you when you dedicate your books to somebody. I mean, it's clear that you're, when you start off, you got to dedicate a book to your, your spouse or your parents or. Yeah. I, maybe haven't gotten, I haven't gotten through all my family members yet. So I'm still on that. <laughs> well, I was like, I was like, this is an odd book for me, you know, and who am I going to give it to? And then, and then I thought about this crazy writer who nobody really knows about, who just sort of disappeared into the Mexican desert and you know, how improbable a career like that would be in the 21st century. Um, But how I sort of like the spirit of his books and how I think his books are still alive today. And so he was inspiring to me. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm sort of at, you know, five books into my career. I'm inspired by anybody who just kind of keeps going um, and tries (laughs) tries to get better at their craft because it's, you know, it's a, improbable way to lead your life so was there you know I I think about that because I wrote three books that were all part of the same series and then I wrote another one that was pretty different and so I felt like I learned a lot doing that did you was there any were there any skills that you didn't have before this book that you feel like you have now hmm I guess meth writing meth writing yeah I mean, you know, one thing, I I don't know if it's like a skill, I I guess in some ways it's sort of a regret. Um, I I guess I always wish I had more time with a book. I I wish I had the space in my life to take five years on every book. Um, Because I think there are things that you realize about your care. If you're being honest with yourself as a writer, there's things that you might realize about a character after it's too late to do Mm. something about it. Um, I I don't know that I hear a lot of people necessarily uh, own up to that, but I feel like there were, there were a couple things that I wish I could add in, Um, but I couldn't, Uh, I couldn't unlock that puzzle in the time. You know what I mean? Anything that would make sense to share? Well, um, actually, I mean, I'd kind of like to, I'd, and I'd kind of like to write a sequel. Oh, I don't know. Cool. If, I don't know if, I don't know if anyone's interested in the sequel, I but, would I, read a I sequel. Think, but I think there's like elements of what you were talking about with like buried treasure and Western sort of motifs uh, that I'd like to revisit. Yeah. I would totally read a sequel to this book. Uh, cool. the, yeah. The characters have juice. Like they're just, Thanks. they're interesting. Thanks. Um, we, another question we have is, uh, do you think there have been more readers and more avid readers emerging as a result of the pandemic? Do you have an opinion on that? I hope so. I think people have had more time. They've been stuck at home. When I talk to booksellers, I think it's been a difficult time. What I hear from booksellers is that they're putting in a lot. They're putting in extra work, right? Because they have to ship, yeah. they have to package, but that they're still selling lots of books. Maybe they're even selling more books. I hope they so are I hope they are too. Um, so I hope it's led to more readers. What do you think? What are you hearing? I don't know. You know, I, um, I feel like I, I, I feel like a lot of people, at least earlier in lockdown, also just didn't have the focus. But 
I hope that yeah, I've read a lot this yeah. year. Although I've 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 become kind of an audiobook person in uh that yeah. was a side effect of becoming a parent <laughs> during a pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I yeah. mean like I I think uh in a year when uh it was hard to kind of leave the house, you know, read a book, you leave the house. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one thing that I I don't know if it's helpful, the books, it it wasn't in my experience. Well, hell, we're a book family. We're buying books, even if we can't read them, right? We're just buying books because we yeah. love books. But but I also returned to my bookshelves and thought about like reading books that have been sitting there for five years. Yeah, so, me too. That, that was good. Well, we have reached the top of the hour. I will add as a bookseller that we, we saw that too. I, I think, yes, we were shipping out a lot of books but we're also seeing people uh buy a lot of books like to inform themselves about things that were going on in the world which was like heartening so it's always nice to ship out books uh that were sort of like dug a little deeper into american history in addition to like novels and everything else uh right. so hopefully those people are being avid readers um, I will also mention too that if you do like audiobooks, that you can purchase uh, audiobooks uh, through Libro FM in a way that benefits Literati Bookstore. Um, they've got everything that Audible's got, but uh, and you also get a free credit every month, so you can get a free uh, audiobook for your subscription every month, and uh, your purchases go towards a chunk of that change comes back to to our store in a, in a fun way. Um, so if you want to do that for your audiobook needs. Uh, I have been doing that for the past 18 months as well. Uh, and uh, of course, you can purchase Godspeed uh, from Literati Bookstore. I have the link in the chat. And also, there are links right below me if you're watching us later on YouTube. But Nicholas Butler, Steph Chaw, thank you so much for joining us this evening at Home with Literati. We hope you continue to stay safe and be well. And hopefully, we can have you in the bookstore soon. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thank you so much. Thanks, Steph. Great to I see appreciate you, you. Yeah, good to see you again. Take care. I'll have a great weekend. Bye -bye.